yours. Right on. So I, I promise I won't take as much time as Joe. I know he was here for an hour and a half, so I can get long-winded too, but I won't. So I, we're going to tie one of these poppers here today. Um, it's really easy. It looks complicated, but it's not. It's literally three or four materials. So there it goes. Um, if And it's only, literally, if I wasn't talking, you could probably tie this in less than 10 minutes. So, and I'll talk to you about, I'm going to show you the materials that I use to tie this that I've kind of, I, I change things all the time with stuff, but there's, I'm also talk to you about a couple of other substitutes. So, like, if you can't find a certain feather, because I'll tell you what else you can use. And you want it, uh, one thing is you want to encourage these guys. Yep. You guys can't see if it's, yep. stand right here, we made this. Move right up. Stand right here and we'll look at what he's doing. Yep. So we encourage you to see in here. Plenty of room. Well, I try to get up to the end behind him and look over his shoulder. It's all good. Come on up. It's all good. Not a problem. Um. Yep. We'll do. We'll do. Um, the cool thing with these two is you, you can get as creative as you want with colors. So um, you're probably wondering, there's a couple different ways you can color these popper heads. You can just take a straight marker on these if you want. Um, the downside to that is if it's like a water-based marker, it's going to wear off. So uh, you'll see I, I pre-color these, and I use an airbrush. Like I use the Copic system. It's, it's easy. Um, but Copic is all water-based, so this will run. So there's a couple different ways that you can coat these so that this paint will not come off. So some people like to use, there's this stuff called Plasti Dip. You could dip it in that. It's a really viscous type material. I don't particularly like it. If you're not super precise with it, it's going to go on really, really, really heavy. Um, another thing you can do too, is, uh, it, but it's in an aerosol can, you get some ac acrylic clear top coat from 3M. You can spray that on there as well, too. That'll dry quick. What I use, and one of the guys that um, turned me on to it was Brad Buzzy. I don't know if you know Buzzy from Buzzfly. But he takes um, liquid fusion, and you mix it with a little bit of water. And then you basically just coat it. And I, and I like it because this doesn't give me a super shiny coat to it. That's just me. I don't want it like super shiny and build up all this crazy extra mass on it. I want to try and keep this as light as possible so that it's still going to be a popper and not sink. If I want to sink it, I'll fish it on a sinking line, right? So um, they'll pre-paint all these, and you can do all kinds of crazy fades and whatnot, and you can put different types of colors and shades. Like I've got some other ones. Like these are, you know, two-tone. you got a, an olive and, you know, yellow color here and a blue and white and a gray and white. And then I've got a couple at the desk, if you come over and see me after, that are a, like a black over gold, which is really cool, like a Rapala. You know, some of those Rapala colors that are real hot. So the, the color... Schemes on these are endless. But to be honest with you, the fish don't care. You could just do a straight all white, and you're going to catch just as many fish. It's kind of like the eyes on them. You'll see me when I go to put these on. You don't really need to put these eyes on there. They're not going to guarantee you any more fish. But they look good when people come up. That's the first thing you're drawn to, right? So you can omit those if you're looking to save time. So the first thing first, um, I tie these for uh, musky, pike, for a lot of the guys that like to chase predator fish. Um, I'll use a different style hook. The hook we're using on this one today, it's an Air X 280 minnow hook, but you can also use a Blue Water 270, which is in this package. It's a little bit bigger. Um, anywhere from like a, a, a size 1 all the way up to even like a 4 odd or a 6 odd, depending on how big you want these. These guys here are right around that 6 inch range. I think this is like the wheelhouse for like the you know utility fish all the time type stuff, but you can make them even bigger. Um, so if I know I'm going to be going for fish that have really hard bony mouths, that have a real chance you're going to break the hook, then I'm going to stick with the saltwater style hook. But if I'm going to go and fish for, you know, pike and muskie, I'm not really too concerned about them breaking the hook, then I'll go to, you know, something that's not, you know, saltwater based, like a, uh, you know, a, a partridge predator, predator X, things of that nature. So the hooks, you got some options there. The thread stays the same. I, I'm using a 140 Vivas, but you can use 140, 210, Whatever works best for you. It doesn't necessarily need to be Vivas thread. I just am partial to this, so this is what I use. And when I go to tie these, I try to stay, when it comes to the color of the thread, I try to stay true to what the underbody of the, of the fly is. So if the underbody and the overall tone is white, then I'll stay with white. You know, you, you could use any color you want. It's really not that important. Um, always start with the rear hook. Um, a couple other things, too, before I get tying on this. 
the all the materials are basically these howitzer poppers here. Can you guys see that up there? Yes, no? Okay, if not, I'll show you this way. This is the medium. They come in two sizes, the medium and a large. The large is huge. It's like almost three quarters of an inch, which is like pushing the envelope with a fly rod, to be quite honest with you. All right, um, I think this is the overall best size. I use this one the most, even with a bigger hook. Um, I'm going to use, for the tail on this today, I'm going to use some Whiting American Rooster Saddle, but you can also use Schlappen. You could use um, any of the regular saddles that you use for like deceivers, streamers, things like that. Um, I've used Hen on some of the smaller ones. Hen's nice because it's softer, so it moves more. If you really want the tail to dance a lot more than this, because this is going to be a pretty rigid tail for the most part, the way I'm tying it in. If you want a tail that's really going to move a lot, then I would use one or two to four uh full slapping feathers. Biggest thing when you pull them out is you want to make sure that they're webby, right? And you don't want to use a stem on those if you want more movement that's softer, not super stiff. Because you'll see with these here today, when I tie these, this has got a pretty stiff tail feather on it, right? Um, the overall body of this is just, it's an EP brush. This has been a game changer and a lifesaver over the years because I used to have to spin all my brushes by hand, but now there's like 40 or 50 different styles of brushes out there, which takes away time from tying. So this is an ultra brush. It's like the biggest one he makes. It's like five inches. It's like that big, right? So the cool thing with these two, if you're building a fly with some taper in it, you can pre-taper it before you tie it, all right? So if I know my, my fly is going to be smaller at the tail end, if you want to do that, and you want to make it have a little bit broader scope near the head, you can kind of taper this with your scissors, come in here with your scissors and cut this and taper it. Now you just wrap it and you're good to go. And you might have to cut it a little bit. Um, this style fly we're going to tie here, we don't have to worry about pre-tapering it because we're going to brush a lot of it out. There's some different types of flash in here. Um, and I'll show you. I probably won't catch it on the camera, but I'm using a predator flash because it's much longer. Um, and you're going to hear me talk a lot about like not wasting material. I try to be as frugal as possible with everything. So I find that if I use this longer stuff and I cut it in half and then tie it in from the halfway point of that, I waste less, right? So then that means I'm making my money go a lot farther. I'm sure Scott doesn't want to hear that, but why don't you buy more materials, right? So there's that in there. There's a little bit of lateral scale, and you can play around with whatever colors you want in here. We're going to do this exact color right here. This is chartreuse over white. It's one of my favorites. And so there's a little bit of uh, like chartreuse lateral scale in here, but you could do regular pearl. It's really not that important, okay? What I also do before I get started is when I know I'm going to be using these popper heads, you can kind of see, I don't know if you guys can make it out, there's already there's pre-holes put in these. You have to basically poke a hole in this to get this over your hook, over the shank or whatever. The best way to do that is you use a bodkin, and I didn't bring a lighter with me today. You typically will, will figure out where you want this to go in there, and you want to kind of center it as best as you can. Usually I'll use a, like a pen, fine tip pen, put a dot there, put a dot in the front, and I try and line it up with the bodkin. If you heat this bodkin up with a lighter before you push it through, it'll go through that foam a lot easier. And then while that's still warm, because we're going to be putting this popper head on a shank, you've got all that metal you've got to get this thing through, right? So you have to basically push that popper over it. The easiest way to do so is to basically cut a crease in there. Or when this is heated up, you move it back and forth, and it'll make a nice little flat area for you to put that popper on, okay? You can also, I don't know if you can make this out in here, um, but you take your scissors and you put it right in here where that hole is, just like I did there. And now I've basically put that popper head right on there and I've cut that, basically cut that um, channel right through there if you can kind of make that out, all right? But I'll go over that when we get there. <coughs> so I've got my, this is a two-watt hook, or actually, no, I think it's a three-watt hook in the vise. I'm going to start with this first. Just attach your thread and you're going to work your thread right down from the eye all the way to about the bend in the hook or where the barb is. Right about there. You kind of let it hang. So I like to put a little bit of flash in between my tails on here, just so there's some in the back. So what I'll do is I'll come in here, and less is more. So I'll take about half of what I think I need. So that might be like five or six strands. Try and cut it right up into there so you're not wasting it. Find the midway point, just like I have here. Fold it in half. Now, if you want to create taper with this, I mean, what's the first thing most of us do? We, you know, if you're dealing with synthetics and you, you don't have 
excuse me, the taper that you want, but we want to build taper. There's a lot of different ways you can do it, right? You can cut the material straight across, manipulate it in your hand, or what you can do is, see, I've got this loop here. Instead of cutting it right here, and now I've got all my pieces of flash are the same length, I take a quarter turn, and now I've already built a little bit of taper in there, right? So I've got some longer fibers and some shorter ones. And then I can kind of just roll them around. I'm going to tie this in in the middle. I want my flash to be roughly a little bit longer than where the tips of those feathers are going to be. It doesn't have to be. It can be shorter. It can be longer. That's kind of where I want it. I want a little bit of flash near the tail. So once I've kind of find, found the midway point, I'm going to tie this in right on the top with a couple of loose turns. And then if I really want this to roll around, I can just take my fingers loosely, kind of manipulate that material like so, hold this thread kind of tight, and then wrap it right back over itself. And I've got a nice little bundle right there. <clears throat> when I go to go through these feathers, a couple things I'm looking for. While I really like a lot of the um, rooster saddles for, I mean, a lot of you guys probably like tie deceivers and things of that nature. Um, if you're looking for something with a feather tail, these are really, really webby. I think the whiting ones are the best ones out there. And you can find some that are, this one's a little chewed up right here, but we can still use it. Um, you'll find s there's a wider variety of depth and width in these, but they're really, really webby, which is what I like because it gives off that nice profile that I'm looking for for the tail. There's a, a ton of different ways you can tie these in. What I want to do is try and find two feathers that are relatively similar in size and shape. So if I paired this one up with these two, you can kind of see it's a little bit wider here. I'm going to have one side that's a little wider than the other, and that's not good. So you want to try and go through there and find two feathers that are relatively similar. What I'll do if I know I'm tying a bunch of these at a time, I'll take the time to go in there and pull out and set aside all my tails in advance so that I can just basically go pick them up, tie them in, and go. There's a couple different ways you can affix these on there. So I kind of measure this out, see where how long of a tail I want. And then I'm, well, I've got the two feathers together, so they're the same. I'm just going to strip some of this fluff away right here. Right? And now it looks relatively good. The next thing I'm going to do, <clears throat> you can glue these together and tie them in on top of the hook. That's one way. But what I'm going to do today is I'm actually going to flatten out the stem a little bit so that it has some purchase and it'll catch my thread so that it'll keep it in that position as I wrap my thread forward so that my feathers aren't rolling because I want them to be just like so, okay? So I'll come in here with my um, non-serrated pliers and I'm just going to take the stem and kind of flatten it out. If you guys can kind of see that. I'm not sure how much of that you can see up there. And I'll do that to both. And you can kind of see I'm going about a half inch up the remainder of this bare stem here because I'm going to lash that right to the hook. What you can also do, which will help just a little bit, just put a little drop of gel Loctite on the near side where your thread's hanging. Just a little touch and a little touch on the other side. Get your feather in position. Hold it right where you want it. And then I'll take one or two turns right over it. Now you kind of see what I'm trying to do is keep that stem in line with the shank of the hook. Bring the second one over. Try and line it up as best you can. Do the same thing on the far side. This is where the first few wraps are going to be crucial. Once you get that in place, then you can kind of put some pressure on it. And your pressure when you tie this is going to be from side to side. So as I take one wrap this way, I pull a little bit. I go that way, I pull a little bit. Instead of down and up. Make sense? You guys tracking? Not putting you to sleep yet? Okay. Once you've gotten past like the halfway point, you can kind of just cut that off. And this is going to help you kind of mirror those two feathers right to that hook. And then I'm just going to come back down through here. That glue's kind of set up. And now I've just kind of set my little tail there. And it keeps it right in place. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to take that brush. So you can kind of see some of these. when you If you spin these up yourself... These are all brushed out, so all the fibers going in one direction. But if you spin your own brushes, you're going to see it's going to be a total mess. And then you've got to comb the whole thing out, right? These are kind of all the, all the hard work is done. When you go to tie in with this, and you'll see it when I start the front half of this, I want to kind of tie down, excuse me, right to that bare wire. Be mindful this is stainless steel, so don't use your good scissors. These are pretty beat up, so I don't mind. Use a, use a bad pair of scissors because you'll wreck your scissors cutting this stuff, okay? 
So take your brush, and then we're just going to wrap, make a nice, if you can kind of see what I'm trying to do is build a nice clean ramp of thread under there. Got a little bit of light on there. Right on. I forgot, I'm sorry. <coughs> yeah, you guys can all filter right in. So I Got it. So now that I've got that affixed, what you see, I've, I've basically advanced my thread right up to the eye. The back half of this is like super, super quick. I mean, when I tell you this is a pretty quick quick fly, if I shut up, we'd, we'd already be done with the entire thing. So what I'm going to do to make it a little bit easier is just take that fiber, just like you do with like a regular hackle or a feather, you try and stroke all those fibers to one direction, right? So that when I go to wrap this, it's going to make it easier for me to wrap it. What I also don't want to do is you can get way out of control and out of hand wrapping these by, you know, you'll watch an br entire brush burn through, you'll burn through one of these in like no time. If you do the wraps extremely, extremely close, it's actually more beneficial and it, you'll have a better profile and you'll have less material and it'll shed water better if less is more. So what my trick is, I try to make each one of these wraps about an eighth of an inch in diameter. So you see where my scissors are on there right now? That's about how far apart I want them. What that's also going to do is let that material breathe a little bit, right? And we'll brush it out as we go. So we'll take and just work our way. Don't, don't be so concerned if some of these get kind of trapped a little bit because we're going to kind of pick those out real quick. When I get to about the halfway point, every, every other turn I'm going to start kind of teasing and playing with some of those fibers to get them out. You can use a nice little brush here. This will comb that stuff right out as well. You can kind of see it's going to kind of make that fiber lay rearward. Hit the camera. Out of focus, or are we good? Right on. Got a hot spot on there, though, because it's white. Once I get the, the brush right up to the basically the base of the eye, that's where I'll take my scissors. I'll come through here and just kind of pick out some of those materials so I'm not catching anything, just so I got a bare spot there to kind of wrap my thread. And I'll take like three turns right over the top of it, a couple in front, and then with your bad scissors, don't use your good ones, come in here and cut it off. Set that aside because you're going to use that in the front. Now, what ends up happening every time you do that, when you cut stainless steel wire, you're going to create a burr there, right? So I take the edge of the scissor, and I just kind of flatten that out so I don't wreck my thread. Nothing worse where you get partially through a fly, and then you, you cut some wire on there, and then it frays your thread, and then the whole thing falls apart on you. So that's what we don't want to do. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one piece of lateral scale, And you don't even really necessarily need to put this on there. I just like the way that it looks. So we're going to tie this in, and you'll see it's got a natural curvature to it. I want it to kind of curve away from the fly. So it's curving out like this. And I want it to go roughly about two-thirds of the length of that. So, and I want to keep it right along the side. So I'll take one, two turns, and then to help it prevent it from falling out, I fold it rearward, take another turn over it, and then clip it. Take one more turn, and now the easiest way to measure this without having to go back in and cut it or waste any more. Just kind of basically line it up with the one that's on there now, invert your vise, and just go right to the other side. And now, boom, we're right there, right? Two, three, two, three turns, fold it over, same thing. Cut that off, and now I've got that nice lateral scale on either side. And you can let that sit there. So because this one is um, chartreuse and white, I'm going to put a little bit of chartreuse backer on this so that we keep that same color going. And the dubbing that I'm using here, I'm, I'm sure everybody's familiar with laser dub now, right? This is a larger type of material that I like. Um, I think Scott's actually going to be carrying this in the shop, I'm pretty sure now. It's magnum dub. It's the same material except it's four inches long. So you can do the same thing with it. Um, it has some flash built into it, and I think it comes in like 55 colors. So, And some funny names too, like Homeless Care Bear and things like that. Um, so... You, you, you can pretty much make whatever color you want of this. I'm, I'm going to take a little bit of chartreuse. It's the same thing. Ha less is more, so I don't need a ton on this here. It's really easy stuff to work with. 
and you kind of card it. So you pull it apart until all the fibers are running in the same direction, and then we're going to tie it in right in the middle. But I want this to stay right on the top. So once I get that in position, I'll take one wrap, two wraps, right? And then this is all you do. Just fold it rearward like that, and it just kind of catches itself. And then I'm just going to build the thread head, and we'll whip finish this off. And then the rear portion of this popper is done. <coughs> You can use whatever you like for glue on this. Sally Hansen's works. I'm going to put some bone dry on here, hit it with a torch, and be done. I always like to cover up those thread wraps. God forbid you catch some sort of toothy fish and nicks the thread, and then the whole thing falls apart on you, right? So that's the last thing I want. Same thing. You can take your little brush here, kind of brush that stuff out. And now we've got our top and our bottom. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to put the front portion of this on here, and we're going to be tying this on a shank. So I can't remember the exact size of this. I want to say it's 35 millimeter, but it's a big game shank, so it's a heavier wire. If you were to use a standard wire shank on this and you were to hook a pretty good fish on it, it's probably going to bend it. So you want something with some meat to it. <clears throat> and what you also notice, too, is one of the eyes is bigger than the other. So this is the one that you're going to want to hook into the eye of the hook. See the difference in the size here as opposed to this one. So when you go to tie these in or place them onto the hook, make sure you take a look at it because you want to get as much movement out of the back of this pattern as you possibly can. So you want to make sure that the larger loop is going through the eye of the hook. All right? Once you got that in place, then we're going to pop this out. Now we're going to put our shank right in there. And I suggest so you don't bury this hook in your hand, put something on there. I steal uh, hair clips from my wife, pop that right in there. They don't have to worry about it. That keeps it right out of the way. You could use lead wire too. If you got some wire kicking around on your bench, just wrap it right on there and you're good to go. <clears throat> what I will tell you with a lot of these shanks too, I've had hit or miss luck with some of them because they are like 90 degrees offset. So one eye's this way, one's that way, right? Um, sometimes I'll find that when they manufacture these, if you're not making them yourself, that the eyes aren't level. So you might have to come in there with your pliers, just kind of bend it just a touch to make sure that it's flat. What you also want to watch out for too is these aren't as bad. These big game shanks have almost a full return. Um, they, the two pieces meet. But some of the smaller ones, they don't have a full return, unlike the partridge ones. The partridge shanks have a full return, which is nice because it'll give you a nice even body and underbody on there. But a lot of them... The, where the wire's cut is way back here. So you have this massive progressive bump that stops right there, and then you got just a bare shank, okay? Well, when they go to cut this sometimes, it can be really sharp. So I keep a, a file, a small file, even a fingernail file on, the, on my bench, and I'll kind of grind that down and file it down sometimes because there's nothing worse where you just start tying, and as soon as you get to that point, your thread just rips right off of there because it's so sharp. So be mindful of that. Check them before you start tying. It'll save you some time. So same thing. I'm, I'm just going to start my thread right up here, and we're going to build a thread base. And you'll see this is like if you've never tied on a shank, there's some finer nuances and points here you got to get it used to because it's not like on a hook. As you can see, you got wire in all different directions. i got a piece up here, one that's facing that way, if you can kind of see a little bit. So I chase this thread as far back as I can. And if I have to, if you watch what I do here, I kind of tie it on an angle to get myself over this. That way I can kind of cinch that down guys catch that right and then you can cut this off this is going to have a tendency to move around on you too so it's after you get a couple courses of thread on there what i'll do is i'll progressively get tighter with it and I, the thread that i put on here is more so just so i have something to bind the material to otherwise it's going to just you're going to chase it the whole way all right so now i'll probably tighten it down just a little bit more and i've got that in place so the next thing we're going to do is kind of repeating what went on here we're going to take that brush that we had before, and you can see now that I've tied with it, it's not flat anymore, right? It's all over the place. So there's a little bit of twist involved there. So try and find which direction that wire is going, and you want to work with it. So you're not fighting it the whole time. It's kind of like if you get a hackle, you go to turn a hackle, and it spins on you, and you feel like you're fighting it, right? You try and reverse it and go the other direction, and it'll lay the way you want it. It's the same thing with this. It works just like a feather. First thing I'll do, though, is I'll get right in there, and I'm going to cut away about 
quarter of an inch of material so that I have something that I can bind the thread down to. Just catch it with the thread, and then I'll take a couple courses of thread right over that. It just takes, what, what another 10 seconds, but I know it's not going to pop out. And then I'm going to advance my thread right to about that point. You can see here where I'm just over that next piece of metal from the shank, so that I, that's where I'm going to tie this off. So one of the questions I get when you're making these is, you know, wh what do I use for reference points? Because I still got to get this popper head on here, right? So my wing, believe it or not, is actually going to stop somewhere up in here because these are cupped, right? So I don't want to stop it way back here because then I'm going to have this giant bald space right there. I want that material to go right up into here so when I, when I fish this, this whole thing moves and it expands and it has all this shape. So I basically, if you've never tied with these, I look at where this is and if I put this popper on there, popper head, the base of it's right about there. That's where I want to stop that because my next section of my wing is going to go from there in a little bit further. All right? <clears throat> so that's past the halfway point. We're going to do exactly what we did on the front or the rear portion. We're just going to wrap this like we did and open consecutive wraps. You could stack tie synthetic on this if you wanted to, but this is much quicker. Got stuff flying around here. I feel like I'm at home. Um, just work your way right up to where your thread is. To try and not capture as many pieces of fiber in there. You saw what I did. I take my scissors and kind of go in here and pull it apart. Take three turns over it, advance my thread, and take a couple in front. Same thing, there's a burr right there. So flatten that burr out. Right? Take your brush. Brush a little bit out here. So on some of the larger um, predator-style ones that I tie in these, I might be using like a, um, like a barred grizzly tail, and I want to put some barring in the, in the front portion of this as well, off to the sides. This would be where I would add in one of those smaller barred feathers. And that's completely up to you if you want to do that. Um, if I really want to have a fly that's going to pop, then I'll put that in there. But for these ones with the solid tails, I don't typically add any extra feather in there. I just think it's a, it's a wasted piece of material. If you don't need it, don't put it in there, right? So, but if you like the way it looks, go for it. <clears throat> Once I've got that in place, then I'm going to add a, a little bit more flash again. Same thing, I'm going to use this long predator flash. I'll take two strands this time, cut it, find the middle, like here, trim it again, and then I'm going to basically find the middle of this one more time. Lay this right on the top. And this is, you don't necessarily need this extra flash in there, but I, I kind of like it. I like if I've got flash in the back, I want to have some up in the front. I'll take two turns over it, fold it rearward, and now that's kind of bled into there. If some of my fibers are not the same length or one's longer than the other, then I can go in and trim it. But if you do that just how I did there, everything is going to come out relatively uniform. All right? The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add, and this tail is kind of chewed up. You, if you guys know me, I like I have an affinity for Arctic Fox. There's just something about it. Like some guys really love bucktail, which I do, but this is one of my favorite materials. But I will tell you this, you want to go sparingly with this because it is softer and it will collect water and it will get waterlogged. So what you'll find is I, I see a lot of people start tying with this and they use way too much. So less is more, but you can't beat how this stuff moves in the water. So... To give me a little bit of a collar in here, an under collar, I'm going to use some Arctic Fox. And I try to find this tail is pretty chewed up now. What I, what I typically try to do when I buy these is I, I try to find the longest hair I possibly can because I can deal with length if I have to. I can always shorten it a hair, but I can never make it any longer, right? So I want something that's going to kind of bleed into this whole collar. So this is some pretty good hair here. I'm going to take roughly a pencil, pencil's diameter uh, worth, go right down to the hide trim it flat, and I'm going to comb out all this under fur. So you see me switch my hands. There's a lot of under fur in here. And this is a flea comb. Pat Cohen uses these for deer hair too. They're, they have multiple uses. They're fantastic. That's all the extra fuzz that I just got out of there, which would create a lot of extra bulk when I go to tie this in, right? So the big thing is, is I want to keep this, all these tips relatively aligned. You're not going to stack these in a stack or anything, but 
Now I kind of look at where I want this to go that looks about right. I'm going to reverse tie it. I'm just going to take my scissors right here, cut this flat, and then I'm going to manipulate this stuff in my fingers so that I can tie it facing forward. And then I'm going to cone it backwards. When I go to tie this in, you see I've got it on the top. I'm going to take my fingers and kind of roll it, and that just puts it all the way around the shank. So I take a couple turns. I'm sorry, I keep forgetting no, to hit no, that no, button. Okay. You're the pro at it anyway. I'll probably shut it off. Right on, <laughs> right on. So, and you'll see, like, less is more on this. You can, like, really, really overdress this by putting too much hair in there, and you don't need a lot. You got to remember, we're trying to throw something big and with a lot of volume on a fly rod, right? You know, so the, the key is most of the poppers and surface plugs you get in the conventional tackle world, they've got some weight to them, right? We want to do the opposite. So we want to keep this thing kind of light so you can throw it make it enjoyable. So less materials more. And I'm just going to take in a pen, kind of fold this stuff rearward. It's just like how Bob does, Bob Popovics with his reverse tie bucktail. It's the same concept. And I'm just going to take and make a nice little loop over here. When I pull down on this, it's going to flare it out. See what I got here? I like the way that looks. It's got a nice even spread. You can even use your brush real quick. Brush some of it out if you want. And then I'm just going to kind of wrap my thread right over that to kind of flatten that out. If, you, if you're super, super anal about this thing falling apart, then you can put some um, resin on there, some glue, whatever, for now. And then what I'm going to do, once I've done that, I'm going to advance my thread right in front here. Now, if it looks like I've used up a little too much space, I just give it a little bit of push. Boom, I'm right there, right? I want my thread to be roughly right about where that bump starts because the next thing we're going to do is we're going to go back to that magnum dubbing. And we're going to use two colors on this. We're going to use the chartreuse on the top, and then we're going to put some pearl on the bottom. So that we're going to use more, though, on this. You can kind of see I have a bigger clump this time, right? Probably twice the amount that I used on the rear because we want to make sure that this fills that whole collar. Just kind of card it. You can see you got some flash built in there. And then I'm going to tie this in right in the center with like two turns. So keep that right on the top. Now if your thread starts to turn the wrong way on you, spin it to the right like so, and it'll kind of cup the way you want it to go. See how it just went like that? If I spun it to the left, it goes crazy on me, right? So spin that to the right, take one turn, pull straight down on it, and then a second turn, okay? And then I invert that in the, in the vise just like so. <clears throat> then I'm going to get some of the pearl. Same thing, I want to use roughly the same amount that I used on the top for the bottom portion. And what you'll find, if you've got this stuff, I buy this in like ounce bags because I use so much of it, but it, it, after you start to get less and less, it will start to ball up on you and you'll get this like balled up mess of garbage. You want to have to pull this stuff apart so that it's all together, so it's all running in the same direction. Same thing right in the center. I'll take two turns over it, and then I'm just going to take a couple more, maybe three, and then I spin my vise with my thread there, and then I'll take the front portion, fold it rearward, advance my thread right in front of it, and then fold the bottom portion forward, or rearward rather, just like so. And now I'm going to build up a little bit of a thread cone right in front of it. Before I go any further, I'm going to take this brush, and this is where you can really blend it. You can go crazy with this stuff with colors. You could put three or four different colors in here, run a couple on each side, and then take this brush and just brush it right through. And now you've got all these, the color combinations are like endless. You can get really crazy with it. But So I have a little bit of a space here, as you can see on either side, if you're looking at it, where that stuff is. But as soon as I take this brush, comb right through there, it all kind of blends in. And now I've got a nice distinct top and bottom on there, right? And there's not a lot on there. I'll pass these around after. They're not super heavy. You guys can manipulate them, check them out. Once I've done that, now I'm just going to take my thread, go right up to where that eye is, and I'm going to build a little bit of a thread, excuse me, base here. Burrito's getting me good. Um, what I'm going to do is there's a lot of different ways that you can get. You see they make popper hooks now that have like a bump in the center of them to prevent it from spinning, right? You can do the same thing with thread. 
So I'm actually going to make a small little thread bump in the center here. So when I put that popper head on there, it's not going to turn around. I'm also going to put a little bit of gel Loctite on there. So you'll see I've got a little bit of a collar right here of thread. And then right up here at about, if you cut this in half, probably the first third of it is where I'm going to put that, that thread bump. Do a little whip finish on there. And you can kind of see I got a nice little thread cone there. Cut that off, right? So now, can you guys see this on this screen up here? Pretty good? So you can kind of see there's that hole there, correct? So that hole is much smaller than that eye. So you heard me talking about how you can make that hole a little bit bigger so that you can slip that on there easier. You take your scissors, just like I have here, and I go straight in, right? And that's going to open up that hole and keep it flat. So I don't have like a huge like open circular hole. It's a flat hole. Make sense? That's going to also help prevent it from spinning. Okay? So I'll do that on one direction, and then I'm going to turn it and do it in the other direction as well, just like so. And I got my scissors right through there, and you can see the, the front of them is poking right out through the back there, or the front rather. Okay? Once I've done that, next thing I'm going to do is just take a little bit of the gel Loctite, and you don't need a lot because if you put too much on here, it's going to bleed into your collar when you push this back. So you always want to kind of start this up here in the front half or middle or just kind of spread it out like I am here because it's going to push back over, the, over those thread wraps. And you've got a little bit of time. This isn't like working with something that's going to lock up right away. It's not like five-second uh, super glue. You're going to take that head and put it on there. Make sure you got the right side. You see how I kind of forced it side to side? That's to help get it around that eye. And then take your thumb and your finger and go right to the front. And I'll push it right on, just like so. And now I've got, you see my collar is coming right out of, up in there. There's not a space. Okay. You can take a look at it from here. Now, you can, there's a couple schools of thought. There's, I, I don't know about you, but like flies like this are an investment, right? It's like buying a plug. So if you're putting this much time and material into it, like I, I don't want to like have this thing fall apart on me. So there's a couple of different things you can do. You can reattach your thread if you like and build the thread base up in front, but with that glue in there, it's not going to come off. But if it makes you feel better, go for it, right? Make sure you coat those thread wraps with something. What you can also do too is you'll see, I don't know how much of that you can see, but there's a little bit of a space down in there where that shank runs, right? So if you wanted, you could even take your resin Put the tip of the resin right down in there. Shoot some resin in there, right? It's another way to do it. I'm going to leave it the way it is. It's going to be just fine because that glue is going to set. It's not going anywhere, right? Now, you heard what I said about the eyes before, right? The eyes are more for us than the fish, but it really makes the fly look clean when you put the eyes on there. And there's so many different types of eyes in, on the market now. You could go crazy with it, right? I really like these super pearl uh, oval style eyes. I just like the way they look. Um, so I'm going to put one on either side, and when you go to glue these in, you l same thing with this, less is more. You just need a little dot right in the center. That's it. I've seen guys gob this whole thing up, and then it all shoots out the sides, and then the problem with that kind of glue, too, is it, it'll turn anything clear foggy, or it'll stick to your finger, and now you're walking around like this looking for your wife or your significant other. Hey, do you got the debonder so I can pop this off your finger? Not like it's been there before, but that will happen. So... Just a little drop is all you need. And then attention to detail. So you can put these eyes, if you take a look at the one that's on there now, it's got a rounded side for the pupil and then a pointy side, right? I mean, you can make this thing look really devious if you want. I like to put it so that that pupil's right there, and I want to make sure they're both lined up the same. Because there's not, if you like tie and you've got, your, got a little OCD going on, there's nothing worse than you pick up a fly and I look at it, and one eye's pupil's going one way and the other's going another. So it takes a second to figure it out, right? So same thing. We're just going to put a little drop right in the center. That's it. Peel your eye off. When you go to peel these off too, you'll kind of see this is on like a waxy style type of paper. Sometimes it'll pull that wax with it, that paper, and you'll have this big piece of like white sticky material stuck to the back. Don't stick it on like that. Make sure you scrape that off because if you don't, it's, your eye is going to pop out. Make sure that the pupil's going in the same direction. Put it on there. And now you've got pupils that are both the same, right? So you could leave this just how it is. It's totally fine. Um, but 
if I'm putting eyes on something, I don't want them popping out. So I'm going to coat them with a little bit of resin. And then that way, these are going to last on there a little bit longer. You get some more use out of the fly. So I put a drop right in the center. I don't know how much of this you guys can see. And then when I, once I've gotten that resin on there, what I want it to do, and you'll see in a moment, is it doesn't just coat the eye, but it also gets onto the foam a little bit. So that way it's kind of coated right over it. So you can kind of see i got a nice little resin coating over the eye. That's going to help keep that thing in place. Do the same thing on the other side. Start right in the middle. And just work that resin right along the edge. Let it kind of set. And that's it. And that whole thing kind of moves like that in the water calm. You can make them smaller than this too. Um, the length of this fly is basically at the mercy of how big the feathers are. All right? You can make them much longer too. Um, you heard me talk about some of the longer ones that we'll tie for like pike and muskie. I, I even had some I sent to a guy who was going fishing for Golden Dorado. They were like 10 or 12 inches long. So um, kind of the sky's the limit in that length. And the only limiting, limiting factor is the length of the feathers that you have. So if you guys want to pass it around, take a look at it. And some other colors, that's it. Yeah. Right on. You guys got any questions on that or no? Yeah, so it's funny you say that. So uh, a couple people had asked about this, about squid patterns, right? It's a good little squid pattern if you take the popper off, right? But we know during squid blitzes, sometimes that's up in the surface, right? So you can, you can use these. I've caught fish with our friend Mark during squid blitzes. Yep. Um, one of the colors that I like to do, and, and, and a lot of times straight all white works good, but a little bit of pink. So you put some pink inside there. Um, like he said, you could omit that popper head on it, and you could even just use like a big uh, oversized eye or a mask or something along that line. Works just fine. Yeah. Or just make a fox collar, you know. Um, and the nice thing with that is there's a couple different ways you can fish it. I talked to another uh, gentleman earlier. I, primarily, I fish this on a floating line. Pretty stout leader. You don't need anything super tapered. You know, I, if I know I'm going to be dealing with some toothy fish, I might even put a, like a wire trace on here. Um, some people had asked about the durability on these. I've got one hanging up in my shop that's got over, in one outing, had a, we had over 100 fish on it. And about 20 or 30 of them were bluefish too. So there were some to tooth marks in the popper, but the, f the fly was still relatively intact and they would still eat it. So the nice thing is with all that synthetic in there too, if you get a fish that tangles this thing up, if you keep one of these brushes in your pocket, all you got to do is just go in there and they drop the fly and just kind of brush it out. So take your, take your brush, boom, go right back in here. You can tease the tail right back out and you're ready to fish again, which is kind of nice. Um, you typically fish that on a floating or an intermediate line, but what, it, what can also be kind of fun is, um, especially with this size head, if you get into the really big one, it's going to be kind of hard to sink it. But if you're fishing uh, like a 9 or a 10 weight and you put like a 350, 400 grain sinking line on there, what's going to happen is now you've got a fly that's relatively neutrally buoyant, but you've got the line sinking. When you strip it, it's going to pull it down through the water column and you'll get a lot of other crazy action out of it. It'll dart, do things of that nature. Um, you can also add a rattle to this if you want. I know there's rattles, there's a couple different schools of thoughts on rattles. I'll, I'll tell you how I feel about rattles. If you can't engage that rattle to make its noise, what's the sense in putting it on there, right? So if it's in a static position when you move it and it doesn't really en engage that rattle in there, is it really making any noise underwater? I don't know. It would be hard to understand. It. So if you're going to put a rattle on this, typically there's two ways you could do it. You could build it up into the head here, and you can actually pour it out a piece of this popper and drill out a hole in the back. I've seen that done where you can pop that in there or tie it right to the shank, which is a little bit more cumbersome, if you've, especially if you deal with some of those larger size rattles. Have you ever seen the, the ones that like Netcraft sells that are like roughly that big? They're almost the size of a pencil in diameter, but they make the most noise. But they're really, really difficult to affix to like a hook or a shank. Then I would try and port something in here, and that would work. Or you, what you can also do is you can put it through a piece of tubing and run that off the back of the fly, all right? 
And if I'm going to do that, then I'm also probably going to keel weight this a little bit, put some more weight in the back so that I know that that tail is going to hang in the water column so that when I give that thing a good pop, it's probably going to rattle a little bit. Um, those are some options. What do you got? Yep, so you can, same thing. So they make, th this particular company makes another popper, the double barrel, which if you turn it around, it becomes a slider. So you absolutely can do that, right? So instead of using this howitzer head, you put a slider head on there, and I'm pretty sure he's got some in there. You'll see one side of it's got an opening just like this has here on the front, so you can pop and chug it, and then it comes down, has a gentle sloping front on the other end. You put that on there, and what you're going to do is you're going to get a completely different action out of this. It's not going to so much pop, but it's going to do this almost like a Zara spook in the water calm. Works really, really well. Um, and that's not just the salt water pattern either. It works really, really good. Um, perfect example, I tied a smaller version of this in all black with a little bit of purple in it. Um, last couple of years, I've been going down to Chile, typically in March. And one of the rivers that we fish has an enormous migratory um, brown trout fishery. They get as big as the Great Lakes. And these things will eat mice during the day. Popper pack. I've caught them on poppers like this. Well, I've tied some sliders like that. Same thing. Throw it in behind big boulders and just dance it across the water. You can also use it as a night fishing pattern. Works 